Thank you all for coming to this event at the Department of English, Rhetoric, and Writing and Speaking Series. Tonight's reading is sponsored by Barry College and the Georgia Poetry Circuit. It is my honor to introduce to you poet, fiction writer, and memoirist, Virgil Suarez. Virgil Suarez was born in Havana, Cuba in 1962 and raised in the United States from 1974. A National Endowment of the Arts Fellowship recipient, he is currently a full professor of creative writing at Florida State University in Tallahassee. Educated in the United States from the age of 12, Suarez has long been concerned with the themes of immigration, exile, and acclimatization to life and culture in the U.S. His more than 20 books, novels, stories, and poetry collections, and edited anthologies reflect these themes of dislocation and uprooting. Suarez has also published numerous stories, translations, essays, and poems in literary journals and reviews, including the Plowshares, Curry Schooner, the Kenyon Review, and many others, both nationally and internationally. Havana lingers, Suarez writes in one poem, vividly recalling a grade school field trip to a hatchery. The speaker reimagining the yellow puffs of chicks scattered on the floor like dandelions, free to float in the air at last, free to float away in the faint breeze of memory across the barren and ravaged fields we now call our childhoods. Freedom, longing, and memory, especially of the Cuba of his childhood, steep these poems. Yes, its landscape of lush palms and vivid parrots, its cane fields and oxen carts, but also the night train the speaker's dissident father had a ride all across Cuba, foraging for food for his family's survival. A father who, in another poem, comes home each night with the blood of horses on his hands from the slaughterhouse, where the government has placed him to kill these horses, to feed the lions in the new government zoo. The father who, once he escaped to America, long refused eat the mangoes he loved, because it so pained him they were not the sweet Cuban ones of home. When asked once how he feels when someone describes him as a Latino writer, Suarez replied, with me it is also about reminding people of the folks I write about, who are still living in exile, who are Cubans yearning for their country to be free. So in this way I don't reject the label so much because it focuses the words on the plight of the people I care most about. I am an American writer. I am a citizen of this country. When I think about being American, I think that also includes the Americas. I live in the United States, but I write globally. We need to start making the connections back to our place in the world community. We belong with other voices on the earth. Virgil Suarez's poems deeply understand the importance of belonging and how timely. We know it will rain for decades when a poem says, those who left will miss their homeland. Those who stayed will say, there is no return. One day, everyone will come together. That's true. For now, we wait. Please join me in welcoming Virgil Swartz. Well, this is a first for me. I want to thank you, uh, not only the faculty and the staff here at Barry College, but uh, the wonderful grounds. I, uh, mm, I might stay. <laughs> um, and I've also never. You know, I thought about maybe reading your poems, but maybe I could do Jonathan Edwards. What is that? Sinners, the hands of an angry God. 
might get some over here. Yeah, yeah, welcome. Um, we're not going to get political right away, so we're going to warm up. Um, you know, I'm, I'm reading to you from a book uh, that uh, brings together a lot of my uh, a lot of my uh, poems from as early as I don't know. Uh, probably 20 years ago to now, and, uh, and I'm really very young to have had uh, a collect, you know, a collection of new, and you know, collected and new. And, but I, but I thought, why not? Uh, in part because I, you know, I ride a motorcycle, so I don't know how long I'll, I'll, I'll be around. You know? <laughs> um, so why not? Um, I'm going to start reading you some poems that begin that will begin to give you an idea of the issues that I encountered early on when my father. Parents arrived, and I'm an only child, and so I, uh, you know, they, my both of my parents, I think their highest level of education was maybe my mother, uh, maybe the, I would say the sixth, seventh grade, and my father eighth. He was lucky, um, and so blue collar workers, factory workers, uh, all of the time that they lived in the United States. My father was dead. My mother is still around. She's about to turn eighty. She has two brand new knees, so she's like a little uh, Edward Ready buddy, you know. She goes, goes, goes. Um, but I'm going to read you this poem. I'm going to start with this poem. It's called The Valley's Lament. And uh, it, uh, yeah, it's self explanatory, but it, it begins to give you an idea of uh, the father son uh, dynamics uh, in, in my life. The Valley's Lament. The president's personal ballet sort of Sancho Panza, retired in Hialeah, his life played out now. Fishing, dominoes with friends, family visits on the weekends, only the few know he wept for the third time in his life during the televised funerals, first the first ladies, then his bosses. Los Americanos, what a bunch of crazies. Every time he thinks he understands them, they confuse him further. None of his sad history would have happened in Cuba, no sir. They took a great man, they took him and worked him into weakness. During those years his job entailed looking out for the president's well-being, providing sustenance. All those late night club sandwiches, the way he liked them, without cheese. In those early morning hours they sat in silence and darkness among the tiles and white counters. They don't call it the White House for the lack of physical purity, right? They sat in silence and he watched as his boss ate. What bothered the president most was the name thing, the liberties with the X as they took it and turned it into a swastika. The night they visited Lincoln and all the students said upon them, he could tell nothing would ever be the same, not only in the house, but with the man. He succumbed to all the pressures. They took a great man and broke him. That never happened in Cuba. That was the joke they shared when the president would smile and say, but it does, Manolo, it does. It happens to great men everywhere. America's long night begun with Kennedy, ended with Nixon. The FBI people came and threatened he'd lose his job if he ever indulged the president's whim ever again. No more such luxuries. The broken choices of a broken man. His job. What did it matter? It would soon be all over for everyone in America. The fucking past, the fucking people, democracy. None of it would have happened in the old country where power corrupted absolutely. So they took a great man and made less of him. Broken, distraught. Manolo wept for the first time when his boss addressed the White House staff and later as he saluted from the helicopter, Manolo never wept again until the televised funerals with Reverend Billy Graham, the girls and their families now. How sad, all of it. Now he fishes, plays dominoes with friends at the park. They all know his story, but nobody brings it up until those moments when Manolo's eyes well up for no apparent reason. And then they ask, what? What is the matter with him? He says nothing. Now, none of it would have ever happened in Cuba. The man nod in understanding. Manolo's lament, the one he'd like to relate if he ever 
writes the book, views of a great man broken, was that he failed to reach over and hug the president when he most needed to be hugged, but he didn't do it. He held the back, and now it has become his deepest regret in all of American history. In America, the business at hand is how to take great men and break them. Break them in like all those horses in the John Wayne Westerns, broken in horses, but not this horse. No. So, um, so you know, as a, quite obvious, my father. I mean, this is a poem about him, and uh, he, uh, you know, he, he, we, we waited in Spain. We left Cuba in 1972, uh, and then we waited in Spain for our visas. And at that time, uh, Cuba and the United States uh, didn't have any relations by that point. And so they worked out a deal whereby Cubans would go to Spain and then we would await our visas. And um, so we arrived late in 74. And so my father was always loyal to, uh, to Richard Nixon. And I started going to school and then coming back and, you know, reading history. And I would tell my father, you know, he, he, Nixon was just not very good. Um, and he'd say things like, yeah, I don't know why you're going to school. They're filling your head with all kinds of lies and nonsense. And I tell him, no, seriously. And, uh, so there was no way for me to change my father's mind, but it was certainly a clear realization that, you know, you react to history based on what is done to you, and you know, and if it's beneficial, um, it's good. If it's not, then it's, uh, you know, it, it, it destroys families and uh, does all kinds of damage to you, to you in your life. Um, so we always had those discussions, my father and I, and uh, he was loyal in that way. And, Respected him for for that, but uh, you know he was wrong. <laughs> All right, let me uh, perfect setting here. The nuns of the family. Here's my disclaimer: I don't know the first thing about religion, and I'm not religious. My mother doesn't know this about me, of course. She likes to believe I still believe. Still prays to St. Jude for my well-being. Whenever the subject of religion comes up, I excuse myself and go to the bathroom or pick up a magazine. See, I don't want to come out and blame the two nuns in our family who visited us in Madrid when we lived there. Thanks to them, my mother says, we were able to get out of Cuba. But the two weeks they spent with us, they took me to church with them twice a day. Once in the morning and once in the late afternoon. At a time when the children, 11 like me, were out playing soccer in the park, and there I was with these two perfect strangers, dressed like penguins, walking to church. Two weeks, and each visit they made me confess. I confessed dry, made up stuff when I ran out of the usual mischief. I told up to the screen in the confessional. The voice behind the screen always said the same thing. Pray, pray, pray for your sins. What sins, I thought. Each time during the Mass, I felt awkward. When people stood, I sat. When they knelt, I stood. What travesty. Then one day, glorious with sunshine, as we walked to church, a truck full of bulls headed for the plaza, stopped, and a bull jumped out of the back and ran down the street, headed directly towards us. And when the nuns started to pray, a man pushed me out of the way into a shop. The bull kept running toward us until the Guardia Civil took out his gun and shot the bull right in front of the nuns. The bull's legs buckled under and the animal fell at their feet. The nuns crossed themselves, grabbed my hand, and rushed me down the sidewalk toward the church. I told the story in the confessional, and there was more silence than usual coming from behind the screen. A miracle, said the voice finally. A miracle? What miracle? I was confused. And I said so for which I was told to pray more than ever before in punishment. The nuns never brought up the bull incident. And after two weeks, they left us for their convent in Seville. So these days, when the nuns in the family come up in conversation, I start thinking about confessing stuff I haven't even done. Pure mischief. Like when I took off my big red t-shirt, tapped on the door of the confessional, and then the priest came out and put his fingers up to his forehead to simulate the horns of a big bad bull. I put the moves of the matador on him, shouting, and you could hear the echoes inside the basilica, ole toro, ole toro, ha! Students today, very smart, very attentive students. Uh, 
it's always a, 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 a treat uh, and a pleasure. And um, we were talking about where you know, poems come from and all that. And um, this is a poem that uh, a student of mine, I don't go to Cuba, I've never gone back uh, in part uh, because, and of course the students know the real, real official reason, but my, my you know, the, my public reason for not going back to Cuba is that uh, if I go back, I have to enter the country as a, you know, uh, as a uh, Cuban national and suspend, uh, you know, float my American citizenship, and I won't do that. I don't do that for any country. Um, so, but you know, my wife has gone back, my, my mother, everybody's gone back, including many of my students. So one of my students brought me a picture as a gift, and I kept it around, and so this poem came from that. Song to the Passion Fruit. Every day at noon, when the noise of the street subsides, the lovers come to this room somewhere in old Havana, in this country of lost causes, and they lie next to each other on hamacas, a hammock he has swung up by the window, low, so that in it their bodies resemble the shape of a canoe, and their sunburned arms as they dangle over the edge, oars, lie there and read what the cracks on the walls say, these love poems and beating flecks of paint, truths in the patches of damp ceiling tiles. After lovemaking, they dream their escapes where so much water fills their being. A fly balances itself on the lip of the water bowl, breaking all that slick portion of smoothness. The burning candle flickers in a moment breeze as it cries on itself slowly, slow like the lovers passing through in this life. They love in this room, silent, oblivious, all the while sparrows are perched on the branches of the fruit tree that grows on the balcony of the lover's window. A fruit tree, its knobby roots each day deeper, twisted into the concrete and wire mesh, grows up here on the third story balcony where sparrows now perch and Green. Theirs is as much a history of this place where the single fruit the tree has given will suddenly be plucked by his arm as it reaches out through the window from the swing of the hammock. This, he says, is the fruit to quench our thirst, the fruit to appease this hunger. He brings this fruit to his lover, puts it close to her mouth, watches as she takes the first bite. Sweet is the juice of oblivion. She now shares it with him. If they have to pretend in this empty room, then they will imagine this is part of some story about to be told at the end of the end of the world when the last two humans embrace, seek consolation that like them, nature has given and given a mother to all. When the fruit is gone and the lovers kiss, the fly plops into the water, gives up his life for the sake of everything magical. My grandparents, uh, shortly after both of them, I think, crossed uh, their 80s, uh, my, my uh, grandmother, the story goes, kicked my grandfather out. And I thought it was a joke, but uh, she meant it. It was true. And so I found out, first through my mother and then through other relatives. Um, and my, mother, my grandmother died first, but she, uh, she was out. She didn't want anything to do with her husband, um, and she met it, and so uh, she went to live with my aunts, and my grandfather for many years stayed behind uh, in, the, in the house uh, that is no longer there. Somebody told me that the uh, house has disappeared, and even the, uh, some of the foundation uh, has eroded now, and you know, nature has taken over it. So uh, this is a poem that I wrote for my grandfather. In the house of white light, when my grandmother left the house to live with my aunts, my grandfather, who spent so much time in the sugarcane fields, returned daily to the emptiness of the clapboard house he built with his own hands. And he sat in the dark to eat beans he cooked right in the can. There, in the half-light, he thought of everything he'd lost, including family, country, land. Sometimes he slept upright on that same chair, only stirred awake by the restlessness of his horse. One night, 
during a lightning storm, my grandfather stripped naked and walked out into the fields around the house saying, I wish lightning would strike me. And he stood with his arms out, the heart rate felt in his face, and then the bolts fell about him. And he danced and cradled these filaments in his arms, but they kept falling, these flashes of white light. And he ran back inside and brought out an armful of large mason jars my mother used, my grandmother used for picking, and he filled them with rectal light. Like babies, he carries he carried the jars inside and set them all about the house, and the house filled with immense blinding light that swallowed everything, including the memories of how each nail sunk into the wood, the water level rose in the well, the loss of his country, the family who refused to accept them now that in this perpetual waking, the world belonged to those who believed in the power of electricity, those moments zapped of anguish, isolation, this clean and pure act of snatching lightning out of heavy air, plucking lightning like flowers from a hillside.
where else do my poems come from? Um, sometimes I'm listening uh, to uh, stuff on the radio, and um, and I hear something that shocks me. The way that I did one day when I was listening to NPR, and they mentioned the fact that Jerry and Hoover uh, liked to put on women's clothes. So I thought that's just too good to pass up. So I wrote this poem. Americans who drag the Rhapsody, J. Edgar Hoover in Havana. He always came to the Tropicana nightclub in Old Havana, a touch of Yves Saint Laurent perfume behind the ears. A contact would meet him there and then take him to the underground gay nightclubs where the free for all made his head spin. After the mojitos and all that bump and grind action, he'd go home with the blonde who caressed his face with smooth, duck feather hands, tickled him on the soft backs of his knees, licked him there where the sultry Cuban man liked to. Something they learned from the French, that much he was sure of. All those nights in Havana, those young men who knew him better than his own mother, Music pulsing behind stucco walls, a light glinting off a chandelier, these nights of release from daily tensions, the games he played, his favorite scene of all any movie was Ava Gardner's scene with the two dark and handsome boys in Night of the Iguana shot in Acapulco. He liked the bite squeeze of flesh, no doubt. One night he painted his lips bright red, put on a flamenco grass sunset red, white polka dots the size of quarters on the ruffles, onyx shiny pumps, and he danced in front of mirrors. Some distant guitar weep and clatter of Castanets helped him keep up, keep up the rhythm. Nobody knew him at the Havana Hilton, not here and not there at the clubs. He loved this anonymity, this disappearing act of vanishing before mirrors, silk scarves around his neck, cotton blouses rubbing against his nipples, all oh, those glorious Havana mornings when he opened the windows to let some light sneak in. People below on the move, the bakery boys coming in from work to work the dough with their rough fingers, pigeons on the wires, a man on a balcony with a cigarette in his mouth, smoke wisping in the wind. How many mornings like this would he have left in the world? How many nights would he feel this rupture of passion unbridled and free? The young man behind him embracing him to greet the day like lovers, the way men have held each other into an eternity. So, uh, you know, I, my students are always troubled because if you, you know, why, why would you write poems about kind of uh, despicable people? But uh, every single despicable person always has, um, you know, another another angle. Nobody is simple. Nobody is black and white. So I think part of the fun is in getting in there and, and, and creating, um, you know, a, a little bit of substance to with the individual. So as a poet, as a writer, I've always enjoyed uh, doing that tremendously. Um, my wife and I sort of live in the country, so we've had to deal with uh, nature at all levels. Um, and I kind of like it, you know. Florida is very interesting uh, in that way. You, you run across flora and fauna that you didn't know, um, you know, existed. And, and so I started caring about that, the natural world. Um, this is a poem that um, came to me when, uh, during a visit uh, to places like the Everglades, which is, has changed in the 20, 23 years that I, that I lived in uh, Tallahassee. So um, I thought, let me, let, me, let me think about this and, and get some of this stuff down before it all goes. Uh, this is a poem called La Florida. Lugubrious days pass with the amplitude of manatees. Hibiscus unfold their smiling vortex to confuse bees. Somewhere near Turkey Point, a crocodile grows a foot by the day. Tourists mistake the big ones for logs. And Hingas play Jesus on the Spanish moss, riddle branches of oaks and junipers crucified in the sun. Fierro Quaker parrots build nests high up in the banyan trees. Or orchid capuchin monkeys lose from an animal distributor warehouse. Memories of the bearded lady and the lizard man retired now in Palatka, holding court in the shade of a parasol by their trailer. Russian midgets 
rockets shot into the eye of the moon, this magic of fireflies zapping their phosphorescence in the night air, jasmine, gardenia. Somewhere, a man barbecues four-inch thick steaks in a thing called the green egg. A firefighter, a player of handball, when his son visits once a year from Vegas, he asks, when will he return to Tampa, his home? Who is allured by so much sun and heat, the permanence of the weather, or by the mystery of sun showers, when the sky opens up and belts the earth with a momentary lapse of crying? Right now, I'm telling you, somewhere in the Everglades, a fish jumps out of the water and into the mouth of an alligator. Nobody's there to witness it, but it happens again and again. Just a couple of more, and then you can throw your questions at me. Um, here's another one. This one is uh, I, I shared with the class today because I was talking about uh, you know some poems that uh, that begin and then you have to stop and and, and rethink them. Uh, and it, I, I read it and reread it because it's one of my favorite poems, and it's a poem that I learned a lot from, uh, just because it's part of the process by which I, I craft my poems. Uh, this was called Purple Finch, another nature related poem. My student and I are sitting out on the deck of my house in Tallahassee, the machinery of spring in full stride, mysterious lavender choking the chain link fence, azaleas crowning oak trees. When a bird flies up the post office shaped bird feeder, a red-throated sparrow, Laura informs me later, isn't the sparrow at all but a purple finch. She looks it up and sends me its description from the North American Field Guide to Birds, where it says it's an easy misnomer made by amateur birders. One can tell because the purple finch looks dipped in raspberry juice. The image stays with me days after Nora sends me the email. I look out beyond the deck at the feeders, searching for and yearning for the, that purple finch to reappear so I can see the striations of purple wisp on its feathers. I think of the man who took his son to the hillside whorehouse, how a rose water scented woman, skin whiter than moon glow, unhooked the boy's belt, lowered his pants, all along whispering some tune in Spanish from long ago days, a bolero perhaps about lost love, and she cuddles with the boy in bed, feeling the soft warm skin of his belly and loins. The boy's nerves prevent him from speaking, but for some reason he feels safe in her bosom, that place where he can see traces of talcum powder mixed with the glitter, tiny specks of it catching the light just so, heaven's wink. In minutes he is dressed and out in the lobby, his father not finished. The boy looks outside a window, and there, a row of hummingbird feeders, the plastic red kind with yellow flowers to fool the birds into thinking of real flowers. But the empty feeders sway in a breeze. The boy hears his father coming down the stairs. The boy thinks of a woman who held him, her face, the boy speaks the name of a red-throated sparrow, better known as a purple finch, the kind that sings once, right before he dies, maybe, or the kind that flutters about before the last kiss, the last blink, the last breath. Um, I, uh, I, I was in the hospital with my father, who was undergoing uh, surgery, uh, from which he never uh, returned because uh, uh, he, a blood clot uh, came up and, and uh, gave him a massive coronary and he died. But at that moment, uh, at that very same moment almost, I was reading uh, a new book of poems by a wonderful poet I admire uh, named Bruce White. And the title of the book is uh, What Saves Us, uh, which is a tremendous book about uh, the horrors of uh, Vietnam um, and being young and, and being so deep in country and, and suffering and all of that. Uh, so I, I was reading that book at the same time that uh, you know we were going in and out trying to find out how my father was doing. This is a poem called My Need of Bruce White. 
Dear Bruce, my mother calls to remind me that today, November 21st, is the anniversary of my father's death, and I recall how five years ago I sat with your words like stilled sparrows on my lap, reading What Saves Us. In all that rain, wet, humidity, I've been trying to track you down because I need to know what that dark felt like in country. Would it be different than my dark here in the woods of North Florida when a rain starts and it sounds like bones crushing under the heat of Agent Orange glow and I hear my father on the bridge of the pond, a bitter song on his lip. He calls forth Lorca, Neruda, Lipo, great poets of water like you, and I hear your voice somewhere in the night. At first, a white hot whisper turned hollow, then resonant with sounds of an impending storm. If we must all die, then why not drown in our own words, our tongues rolling back into our throats to reach all the happy notes? One more? One more, one more, not one more, but one, one more, one more. Um, And what I think about, and 
this comes from my conversations with my mother, who is, uh, I wouldn't say my mother is either a Republican or a Democrat. My mother has no idea. So she basically goes with whatever her teammates and the churches and her friends vote. So they all vote in a block. And uh, it's not to fault her, but she's not very well informed. And the curious thing about me is that my parents took me out of a communist country to spare me all sorts of terrible things, including to be drafted into the military and then sent to Angola as a military advisor, or sent to, I wasn't young, I mean, I wasn't old enough, but there were moments in Vietnam where there were Cuban military advisors fighting, not only on the Cuban side, but also on the American side, and only they could spot each other out because they would, you know, it's a very specific way of speaking Spanish and you can hear it. And so it was a very awkward moment for one Cuban on one side to hear a Cuban from the other side and then to talk about that. Uh, personally, for me, the problem has been that as I moved away, as I continued in school and I moved away from Miami and, and, and the people around me, uh, it wasn't that I became more in tune with American life and all that. It's just that I began to, I would say it's a 360 degree, you know, Turn, but um, the older I became, I realized that I was turning more and more socialist slash communist. And so you see the dilemma, and it's not that I'm a communist communist, but I, I, I'm not liking what I'm saying. Uh, I'm not liking this severe cheapening that has befallen of this country where you know, we all know that that sweater and that tire and that toy is being made by people who are being exploited, uh, but we want it for $7.99. This was last year. This year we want it for $5.99. Next year we will want it for $3.99. Uh, and so we keep getting this stuff and we keep exploiting um, and so it's, you, you begin to think about all of this stuff, you know, the worker, the workers' rights, when do we stop with the, with the madness of, of, of money and wanting to get a value for the dollar? You know, my, my uh, good friend of mine in LA, and he wasn't joking, I think, and I say this because I think it was a wonderful little uh, uh, poem that he wrote, but, uh, uh, you know, he had a poem uh, called Capitalism, and it was just the, the, the repetition of Chief Master Chief. So where, where does it stop? I mean, you, you have a beautiful uh, campus here, absolutely gorgeous, you know, gorgeous. Uh, and I've been, I've been to a lot of campuses up here today. You know, I mean, it's a beautiful place. You tell me who can redo this the day that it comes when we need to do this again. Who can do it and for how much? Where will the labor come from that would know how to do this? Because I don't know if you've noticed, but your country has turned into a very cheap uh, corner. I'll tell you exactly how you put your town. It's like CVS, Walgreens, McDonald's, Burger King, Bank, Church, 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 Bank, Jiffy Lube, uh, Walmart, uh, Deep, Home Depot. And it's like that. And you could find yourself anywhere in this country. Uh, and think that you are home. I, I had a, a, a period of my life when I would get panic attacks uh, because I felt very dislocated by flight. I've always had issues with separation anxiety and all that. It, it's a long story and I'm not going to bother with it. But uh, I remember getting inside taxi cabs and paying a lot of money to have a taxi driver take me to the nearest Walmart right away. Please take me to the nearest Walmart right away because as soon as I entered that store, I was at the one in Tallahassee, and this happened all over the country, you know. Um, and it would, it, and, you know, I, I would explain this to a few professional uh, people who will help me out on a regular basis, and they said, "Well, that's a good survival tactic. That's excellent. I'll tell my other patients to do that, you know." Um, but it's it's the same thing, and there's nothing new about it. 
And so we forget because, and as a professor, I feel this all the time. See, this question is an amazing question. Um, this is what I don't understand. Um, most of my friends went off to school because they were passionate about the thing they were about to do. Most of them became aerospace engineers, all sorts of engineers. They graduated from their BSs uh, with a signing bonus on their third year of college and a contract to go for work for uh, Rockwell and Mary, you know, uh, and some of those aerospace firms out there. And, you know, we would get together and they'd say, so, you're going to stick with this thing called poetry? And I would say, yeah, I have no choice. I, I'm, I'm sick with it. I, I, need, to, I need to write. Uh, you know, it was my grandmother always say, said, never go for the money, go for the thing you're passionate about. They would laugh and blah, blah, So, a good 10 years after we all graduated from college, they all got fired because they no longer needed aerospace engineers because they were either moving the plant or because they had too many or so. They were asked at that point, the way that John McCain comes on all the time, which bothers me tremendously, uh, it says, so you lost your job. Forget about it. Go back to school and get retrained. He's done that to my friends now three times because when they got fired from being aerospace engineers, they went into real estate. That didn't turn out well, and so a lot of them were sort of floundering. And all the time with John McCain saying, no problems, come back to school and get retrained. How many times will you be retrained? How many times will you return to school to learn something else? I, I didn't have to go through that because I was a heat-seeking missile. I knew that I was going to be a poet, I knew I was going to write, and many people saved me on the way. So I was lucky. I'm not, I'm not saying there was anything special about me. But it's like, when is it going to stop? I mean, if you say we are great, where, where is it? Because I would say we're just cheap. the good deal and so people suffer for it. My mother worked in this country for 25 years making 10 cents a zipper. She worked in the garment industry and at that time 10 cents was amazing. Well by the time she retired all of that work had gone elsewhere. You know and it's like that everything that you try to do somebody goes elsewhere. So what are you gonna how are you gonna go out there? What how are you gonna make yourself stand out? How are you gonna be special? How are you going to make your way, not only in this economy, but in this country? You know, so th you have to think about it. The other thing, since I have a stunt, I guess, uh, the other thing I think about, which I never understood, and I want you to think about it too, because it's, it's very disturbing in all the right ways. It makes you think about your existence and your life. Uh, I am mathematically impaired, uh, but I have a fascination uh, with, uh, with the way things uh, you know, are, are thought about, the way things are named. I don't understand time. I have an issue with time. I don't understand it. I arrived in this country not speaking English, and this whole business of Monday through Sunday, and we have, you know, the days of the week are named in Spanish too, but here we have a different rhythm than we do in the rest of the world, which adds to the poison. Monday, you've all been already brainwashed, and, and I hope no, because you'll start kind of smiling and laughing with recognition, I hope. Uh, Monday is Blues Monday. Does anybody know why Blues Monday is called Blues Monday? Oh, wow. Because you have to go back to work, right? If you're religious, uh, we have to work because apparently given certain religions, um, Eve ate from the apple and it made God angry and that was part of the punishment. You have to work for the rest of your days. So what do we do with that? Monday is Blues Monday because it's horrible to have to wake up and go to work. Name the work. Tuesday is Double Shot Tuesday. Does anybody know why it's Double Shot Tuesday? You get two songs on the radio and you get two shots at the bar. Because Monday being back to work was totally brutal. It's just amazing to have to go back to whatever it is that you're doing that's so important. Wednesday is hump day. This is the day that your boss says to you, Harvey, or whatever your name is, I've seen you uh, Monday kind of sluggish. On Tuesday, you've been drinking too much and listening too much of the same bands. Uh, it's Wednesday, my friend. It's time for you to deliver. Uh, you're not leaving before 5, and you're, you know, you're going to leave late, and you're going to give me your best. 
First thing is that they were, nobody knows what to do with it, but everybody simplified because of how it's just beyond the middle of the week. Friday, we even brought God into it. Thank God it's Friday. Thank God it's Friday. It's, it's your, it's, you, you're going to get free. Saturday and Sunday, nobody really cares about, but your neighbors wake you up early because they don't have time to do anything but mow the lawn and you know, clean the yard and blah, blah, blah. Sunday, if you're religious, you go to church and you repent for everything, and then it's back to Monday again. And it repeats itself at infinitum. Mathematically, um, if I said to you, you were going to live to 120 years, and you take 120 years and you compare it or contrast it to eternity, what happens to that number? It becomes insignificant. It becomes less than zero. So how are you going to live your life? In this rhythm, this, if the way things are going, I'm not going to count on Social Security or Medicare or any of that. So that means that we have to all keep working. I love what I do. Will you love what you do? I don't know. But you're going to work and work and work, and it's that rhythm and that rhythm and that rhythm. How are you going to get out of it? I don't know. And now, if you like it, I'm, I'm saying, I'm, I'm talking about, if you love what you do, then you're going to be fine. But if you are miserable because you've already lost your job or you, you know, they've taken what you love to do away from you, you know, and, and young people look for all sorts of things. Like right now, uh, physical therapy is uh, is very hot. Any kind of nursing is very hot. Do all of you want to be physical therapists or nurses? I don't think so. Some of you want to be painters. Some of you want to be architects. Some of you want to be dentists. If we continue with the idea that, oh, I don't want to pay your prices as a dentist. I'm going someplace else and they're going to drill my teeth and do all that for, you know, a third or more than half of what I have to pay you. make these uh, little cigar box guitars and I stopped because I thought, you know, uh, uh, I, I, I spend a lot of time, these are one of a kind objects and I sell them for $500 and I think, how am I competing? And I make also you know, Stratocasters and Fenders and all of that, Gibsons, I, I do them, my guitars do look nothing like anybody else's guitar, but nobody wants to pay that money for it because they much rather get the real thing. And the real thing is Fender from Mexico, and you can get a, a, a beautiful Stratocaster, you know, uh, for $350. So that's what's going on, guys. Anyway, that, I, I hope it's like, whoa, I will never ask another question again, you know. Um, but that's that's where I'm thinking, you know, get off the get off that grind. Um, I don't know what to tell you. It's very scary for me because I sometimes I think about it. It's like, why? What? How can we change the days of the week so that we're free? People tell you, oh, become a doctor. Nobody works harder in my book than doctors. They don't have lives. Their lives do not belong to them for the most part. Uh, they have to do, for example, when the Iraq War started and they needed a lot of doctors. If, if you did a particular kind of uh, surgery and you were one of two or three doctors, guess what? You had to go. It wasn't a matter of, oh, I'd much rather not. You're going. No, but I have a wife and children. You are going um, because your life is not really yours. You have to, you know, you decided to help other people in time, and that's it. Uh, other questions, please. Yes. Do you ever write in Spanish? Uh, no, I, I use Spanish, but uh, my parents never learned English, and um, and I knew early on that I was, I had a lot to say about them and about me and everybody, and uh, so I, I wrote in English that way. They father died without reading it and reading any of my work and, uh, and you know and I, and I apologize if I made you know if I dishonored the, the, the whole idea of fatherhood in your eyes but uh, you know my father was a very interesting man because even when I got to teach you know I, I, I was uh, I started teaching at Florida State and I never left so my father would come and visit and he, he never understood that the, the whole concept of a contract and, and being salaried, the concept of being salaried, he never had any concept of it. And it, you know, for him, he always got paid at the end of every week and he got paid by the hour and all that. So he would say to me, he says, explain to me how it's possible that you are home 
most of the week. And I would tell him, Father, I have, um, I have a contract that basically is broken down like this. 45% uh, of that contract has to do with my coming to the university and teaching. 5% of that contract has to do with my traveling around and doing community-based things, readings and talking to students and all of that. And then the other 50% has to do with my research and my creativity, you know, meaning I'm sitting down to write books and all that. And so he'd say to me, that's fantastic, but can you go in there and ask them for overtime? get paid a, a finite amount of money and that's enough money and that's it, you know. Um, so I, I wrote a lot in, in English because I didn't want them to, I didn't want to hurt them either, but my mother now, my mother's very intelligent, she uh, gets her friends to translate and so every time I get home now, she'll say things to me like, uh, how could you say that I threw a knife at you when you were seven? I'd say, okay, all right, all right. I, I made the fact, I made the thing about being a knife, but you did throw a, 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 a laundry brush, one of those big brushes that you would that you would scrub the clothes. You threw that at me, and then she'd say, oh, I don't remember that. And I'd go, well, you threw something at me, and you know, back and forth. But she's she's getting, uh, and her thing is, please don't embarrass me in front of it with my neighbors, you know. And I tell her things like, but you don't have any neighbors, and they're all dead. You know, it's just you and three ladies down the way. Yeah. Uh, but I, 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 you know, I say that jokingly, but uh, I, I'm terrified that had they been able to read the stuff, and then, you know, we have very difficult moments. Uh, but you have to write what you have to write, whether it's, you know, you, you want to you wanna write the truth. If, if that's what you can witness the truth, you write it. But no, not, not, too, not too much. I mean, I could, I could sit down and translate my stuff and do all of that, but the other thing too is that it, it's political in the way that if I write in English and I call myself a Cuban writer, say, or a Cuban-American writer, somewhere down the line, somebody will have to deal with that. It's like, how could you have a Cuban writer, you know, outside of Cuba writing in English? They're, they're, they're not Cuban, they're American writers. Um, so all of that, it's important to me, so I, I write in English. Other other questions? Yes. Um, you said today earlier in my class when you were there that you, if it were up to you, you would just write all day long. So you said that um, you have a certain schedule. You work on this in the morning, then in the afternoon you transition. But like, when did like just your passion? to write all the time, when was that fostered and when did it turn into it, what it is now? That's a, that's a great question. I, the, uh, I always wrote like that. I, I spoiled myself when I was single and, and quote unquote free. Uh, I wrote all the time. And so I didn't have any responsibilities of the kind of that later, later I grew up by getting married and having children. And it was very selfish on my part, but I, you know, I always tell my students this because you have to write. If you have, if you're gonna write, you have to write. So you have to respect your writing, or people will go of uh, the metamorphosis on you. You know, uh, Greg or Samsa, you will turn into a cockroach, and they won't care. You know, they're not never gonna respect what it is that you do because everybody has needs, right? I mean, children are children. They need to be fed. They need to be changed. All of that. So you know, you do that because that's part of your responsibility. But you also have you can't go around saying I'm working on a novel the way I think a multitude of people do. You know, uh, what do you do? Oh no, I'm a writer. Oh really? What have you written? Well, nothing. But I'm working on a novel, and this goes on for years and years. And these are people who struggle trying to find the time to write, and you have to do it. I don't care if it's through the night, but you have to do it. Um, and that will bring you into conflict with your loved ones because life is ongoing. People, you know, the babies will need diapers. You will need to go out and get milk and diapers and, and food and, and all of that stuff. So when do you, if we know that Monday through Sunday has 24 hours, when do you get the writing done? In my case, I exaggerated and I, I was very greedy about it, but now I'm paying for it because my girls grew up and they left and there is no way for me to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. So when I look at them, I, you know, and they, they, there's, this is not an issue, 
but it's a personal issue for me because I, I do remember the times when I had to rough it and say, I can't play with you because I am working on this thing. Very tough. And when it's your turn, you have to deal with it your own way, but that's how I dealt with it. And so along the way, you will pay, uh, based on your conscience, the time that you stole from people that, you know, but you've got to do it because if I don't do it, then I don't serve anyone. You know, uh, I'm not serving myself and I'm not well and, you know, things break down. But um, you, so you create uh, a routine and you respect that routine when you are in school, single and free, and you make sure you maintain that routine throughout and people will grow up. I mean, I think I ended up serving as an example, both my wife and I, to my children because they knew that we were respecting our, I mean, we were writing, we were creating, they had books, I mean, there was a production that we presented to them, and so they realized, well, my parents are academics, and they work. Uh, and that became useful to them because, uh, like my, you know, this is another thing with my mother, my mother would come and visit, my mother's old world, so she would tell, you know, her business became shorter and shorter each time because my wife would come to me and she said, listen, your mother is once again telling the girls that whatever they're learning in school is pure rubbish and uh, they need to learn how to saw, they need to learn how to cook. And one time she said they need to learn how to serve a man. My wife's head exploded and smoke came out of her ears and she picked up a frying pan and she said, you've got to do something about this because this is not going to fly. You know, my wife would tell my mother, these girls are not going to do any of those things. But how could you say that? You know, these fights that I got old world versus new world. So, and so they grew up just perfectly fine in there, you know, and, and they know that they are going to have a profession and they are going to have a relationship and they're going to have their own families, blah, blah, blah. But they are going to respect that which they have set out to do, which is, I think it's a basic human right. And at the end of the day, people will look at your work and figure out that you did do something. You just didn't pass through and now you are a name on a headstone with a birth date and, a, and, a, and, a, and an end date. What have you done? Well, people, you know, you make a name for yourself, I guess, I don't know. Um, you make a contribution, otherwise you're just a slab um, on top of a, a cold earth. Anything else? You questions? Questions? Actually, I feel great. I mean, this is like you know, I feel very authoritative. You know. Um, what else are you thinking about? Ask now or forever hold your you know, your peace. Yes. I think that it's going to be affected now, and I'm dying to get back to uh, Miami because one of the things, and this is connected to another question that was asked, one of the things to everybody in, that happens to everybody in this country is we arrive from all over the place, and it takes one or two or three generations, and next thing you know, everybody forgets where they've come, and people begin to turn on people. And so this time around, I've heard that the established Cuban community, Old Guard in Miami, has turned against the new arrivals. And so with the help of people like Marco, uh, Marco Rubio and people like that, they overturned the law of dry foot, wet foot, and it's created a lot of animosity between the new arrivals and the old Cubans. And to me, that's a story that repeats itself over and over. We get here, we begin to claim the land, we become part of the land and then it becomes our land. And we don't want other people on our land, including people from our own blood and you know. And, and so that's happening now. I never really thought that would happen, but it, and my mother says things are heated down there. People are getting into arguments and you know, the, the, the new Cubans are looking at the old Cubans like you bastards, I can't believe you know, you don't want us. And, um, and it's, it is crazy, it's weird. Why does that happen? I don't know. Well, I mean, a lot of us, like Germany, uh, uh, Ireland, we, we, we come from all over the place, and 
that clock is very interesting to me. How long does it take for one root to get acclimatized, assimilated, and then to start feeling entitled so that we turn around and we say, no, we don't want those people here and we certainly don't want our own people here. They belong someplace else. This is my country, this is mine, you know. Uh, go away, go away. So it's very strange, very strange. cycle it seems to me but it keeps getting more and more uh, uh, I think uh, overt and more acute and so I think we're gonna fight people are gonna start fighting uh, pretty soon and uh, I have this apocalyptic visions but one of them is that uh, I love the internet and I love my computer and I you know you, we've all been there right you know what happens when the light goes out you you wait you know you start fiddling you know fidgeting it's like Okay, uh, electric company, uh, it's been 20 minutes, is it coming back on? It's like, yeah, yeah, it's out, but you know, we, we've got men out there and women working on it. It might be coming back tomorrow. Tomorrow, no, that's impossible, that can't be, I'm gonna go crazy. You mean I'm gonna have to go outside and talk to people? No. Um, and we haven't gone through that social experiment. I would love that, I mean, you know, I've, I've had a week, beautiful week so far where I, everybody puts away the phones, we talk, we eat, we laugh. When was the last time you did that? Everybody, you know, you were all connected. Uh, so I think the social uh, unrest will come when, when and if whoever is in power shuts down the internet and we get to uh, get really upset about that, you know. If anything would throw us overboard is that it's like, hey, I can't access my YouTube videos. Uh, but uh, maybe not, I don't know, it's a, it, it's a for years, I've seen it turn both, and it happened right around Ralph Nader. It happened first with Ralph Nader, and then it happened with Ross Perot, where Ralph Nader, they ended up turning him into this very tick. You know, he would, he would flinch because he was under a lot of stress, and people started saying, would we have a president with nervous ticks? Of course not. Then we have Ross Perot, remember he had, um, and uh, so they did something to that poor man because you can go back on the record but he got nervous. He says, I have got gotten some envelope and I would like for you guys to leave my family alone and, and then he disappeared. Uh, and so now we have the NFL of American politics. You're either on the red team or on, your, on the blue team. There is no other possibility. Red team, blue team. Nobody gets the stage, nobody else. Red team, blue team, and so we've been set up to play the, uh, the Super Bowl, which is coming up, uh, possibly in these next four years. It's a split country, everybody's armed, and somebody's gonna win. And, uh, and that's it, we'll see. As a writer, I there are no better times. I sit there from my middle of the woods and I look, now when it comes to get me, then I'll have to think of something, but in the meantime, I'm looking and saying, Wow, who would have thunk that after Nixon, after Vietnam, after Nixon, this country would continue to go into depths it's never seen before. And sure enough, now, I mean, two people that I think are loving this is William Randolph Hearst and Mr. P.T. Wharton. Man, if those two were alive today, they would be amazed by all of that initial harvesting they did. It's come to fruition more than ever. Uh, and so this is a real test. Let's see what happens. And you know, we're, we're friendly to one another, but be careful because if you're on the red team, we've got a lot of great people on the blue team. The blue team is armed, the red team is armed. And nobody wants any of that, you know? I, I was writing, I was picked up uh, to be taken to Atlanta, and I was on the train after the, uh, I arrived right in the middle of the, uh, all the marching and all the lots and lots of people. Anyway, the train was delayed because they needed to get everybody back to the city. <laughs> and I was there surrounded by a lot of young people with their hopes and aspirations on these placards. And there was a, an elderly uh, African-American man who was standing next to me and who I, you know, he started saying some stuff 
and I heard him say stuff to these young people, and then it started getting heated, and all of a sudden, I heard the old man say, uh, he is right. We don't need any more criminals in this country. I voted for Trump. And by that point, everybody, there was a communal gasp. And, and then one young kid said, sir, you need better education. And I'll help, you know, I'll help broke loose. I, I was ready to sort of, you know, in my, in my girth, uh, sort of get in the way and, you know, play, uh, play savior, right? Uh, but the old man defended himself pretty well, and it ended up, it gave me hope, because it ended up being a moment where he upheld his First Amendment to say whatever the heck he wanted, and people argued with him, and you know what? He got off by his station, and we went on, and nothing happened. And if it stays like that, my friends, that would, that's what democracy is all about, but I, I don't know. See what happens. I, I hope for the best. Anyway, thank you so much. Uh,